Thank you, everyone. So our next speaker is actually our keynote speaker for today. Dr. Sheila is an international development professional who has supported decision makers in achieving their business, strategic, and financial goals. For over 20 years, she has worked for various UN agencies and international organizations, including the United Nations Development Program, the Environment Program in Uninhabited, and the African Center for Economic Transformation. She has held senior leadership roles based in New York, London, Nairobi, Accra, Cairo, and Amman. As one of the founding members of the Network of African Women Environmentalists, she has tasked by UNEP to develop the Earth Science Cafes, an online platform connecting science to society during the COVID-19 and raising awareness about the forthcoming UN decade of ecosystems restoration. For the UNDP Regional Borough of Africa, she has been designing flagship programs focused on strengthening resilience to help communities build back better after the COVID-19 crisis. Dr. Sheila is trained as a research scientist in the UK with a PhD in biochemistry from London University, followed by a postdoctoral research fellowship at the University of Oxford, focused on genetically modified viruses. She was awarded, of, she was the award of this fellowship by the Daphne Jackson Trust to commemorate the life of Britain's first professor of physics. That sealed her commitment to establish a career which encourages and inspires other women and girls to study science and apply it to every aspect of their lives. This serial entrepreneur has embraced her passion for creative arts to become founder of an online stock photography website called Africa Knows, an online African artisan crafts market called Maasai Soko, and a creative leadership and coaching practice called Creative Life Consultants. She has been active in promoting global action on impact, investing and support for innovation hubs in Kenya through public and private funds for SMEs in the Eastern African region. In 2009, she was included in the first group of 20 inaugural TED followers and in 2016 was honored with the Wings World Quest Foundation Women of Discovery Award for Humanity. It is an honor to introduce everyone to Dr. Sheila. <laughs> Wow, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me well? Yes. I, oh, good, good, good. So first of all, I want to thank Eureka and the Anakazi Center for really this great honor. I'm, 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 I'm really thrilled to be here today. And I wanna thank you for creating this platform to bring people together during this time of crisis and especially to, for offering the privilege for all of us to contribute to the work of the Anakazi Center, which focuses on the socio-economic empowerment of women. Now, I was very moved by Eureka's story, and um, really, if you hear um, that story, and, and there's so many stories like that that ended in, in terrible tragedy, um, you can understand um, really the, the the, the, the terror of the times that we're in and the, and the terror that we have gone through. Um, uh, and, and so it's, it's really wonderful that Anakazi Center continues to do this work. I'm so grateful to God that she pulled through and that she is creating this important space um, for empowering women and continuing to open, to open up the space. Now it's particularly important to me, not just because I'm an African and not just because I have three daughters and also not just because um, I'm a migrant. Um, I came from Nigeria, um, grew up in London and, and, and all of those um, uh, themes are a focus of the Anakazi Center, but it's the, the, that's not, not why it's necessarily um, so close to my heart. It's close to my heart because the issues of for women and girls and migrants in terms of um, uh, supporting 
those particular groups and communities for development, it's, fu it's fundamental. There is no way that we're going to, as a world, um, uh, develop and thrive if the issues of women and girls and also the issues of borders and migration are not, are not um, addressed um, squarely and fairly and equitably. So it's a great on honor for me to be here. And I have, I have to say that um, it, 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 was, it was a bit unexpected because when I was approached by Eureka, um, I was really helping her to find a keynote speaker. And so I thought, yeah, yes, you really need a great keynote speaker. And I was thinking, what would be a great keynote speaker? So in my mind, it was somebody who in their profile, they can say things like, she facilitated a deal of 500 billion USD and has been critical in the top Fortune 500. So I was looking for women like that in those networks and women who work with high net worth women. And so it was really surprising to me when she turned around and said, why could you please be our peanuts, keynote speaker? And I thought, wow. And what's important about that moment is that the recognition that what we thought was valuable, what we thought was important in the world before COVID, those things have changed. But it takes a while for us to get to the realization that the value systems that we came to 2020 with have shifted. And so those of us who in the ladder of things thought perhaps we didn't have voice in a business community, we didn't have voice in particular fora, it is for us now to step up and speak because actually right now everything is being redefined and it is time for women to raise their voice and to be part of the redefinition of the transition and what happens on the other side of this crisis that we're in. So the world has changed. It is changing, it will continue to change. And so the theme of my talk, um, the sub-theme of my talk, uh, my presentation is be the change within the change. And it's about how you, we, all of us should be, embrace the creative power that is in this moment of chaos. Because within this moment of chaos, there is a moment of birthing. There's a birthing of something new and we are all part of it. So I'm going to just split it into two parts. One, the first part, just talk about um, a recognition of the change that has happened to us and where we are at now. And then the second part is just to share and offer us um, a few, five points really, five key point messages about what I think um, women in business um, particularly should be focusing on. So uh, what is the change that we're seeing now? Well, I invite you to cast your mind back to January, February 2020 and think about what you were doing then. So in January, February 2020, I was actually in New York and 2020 seemed like it was lining up to be the decade, you know, the, the moment when um, all of my dreams were going to come true and manifest in, in, in very particular ways. I've been in the development community for a very long time. I've worked within the UN system. Um, but at the heart, I'm a person that is just carrying forward a passion for the transformation of Africa and simply made a vow with myself and a commitment to others that wherever I am, I want to be contributing to that transformation uh, in my home, in my family, in my relationships, in my business in my work, in my knowledge. I want to be uh, contributing to that. And so I was really privileged to be um, offered an opportunity to work with uh, the Regional Bureau for Africa, the headquarters in, um, in, in, in the UN building in New York. And uh, you, know, you know how it feels when you work, go to the, that building, the General Assembly. So I was there from, uh, 20, um, from about July 2019, and I was helping to organize different um, conferences and different programs. One which was particularly exciting because we have visionary leadership from a woman. Uh, the Regional Bureau for Africa is led by an African woman, Ahuna Iziokonwa, who is bold, courageous, and visionary. And she developed a program called African Influencers for Development. And it's about 
how we can harness the power of influence and look at how those influences uh, in music, in business, in, in all kinds of spheres can be part of the development trajectory, part of the transformation process. So I was really thrilled to be supporting that in September 2019 at the, uh, at the side event as part of um, the, the, the deliberations in the General Assembly during that whole, that whole month where the world comes to New York. And the second really great thing that was happening in my life at that time was um, I went to Accra and um, to basically bring together this theme under a conference called Africa's Money for Africa's Development, a Future Beyond Aid. And that was such a shocking headline and I was so pleased to be helping to curate that. And we curated that event, um, brought together 200 senior leadership from the UNDP system, all the country leaders, the headquarter section division heads. And that's when I first encountered uh, Eureka and the Anakazi Center, because she was one of the panelists who um, came in the first event where we looked at different sectors. And so we looked at women and business development and environment and creative arts and all of these powerful forces that are part of and um, are, are the driving the drivers of the African transformation. So she was a speaker at that event. And that's where I began to really uh, know, um, know and understand at the Anakazi Center and the work of Anakazi. So, after that finished, I came back to New York and it was January and I was thinking that I was going to relocate to New York and I'm now trying to you know, found somewhere to live and started to live the New York life. And it took me a moment and I was like, wow, hold on a minute. This is, this is hard. <laughs> New York living is hard and it's expensive. So there I was living in a great but tiny apartment and commuting on the subway to Manhattan every day to um, the UN offices, working a full day coming, collapsing in bed, repeating it the next day, day in, day out. And I thought, hold on a minute. This is the dream. This is the promised land. This is the economic center of the world. This is what people all over are getting on boats and struggling to live this life. And I looked at how I have, I've lived in many other countries. I've lived in Accra, I've lived in Ghana, I've lived in Nigeria, lived for a time in Jordan, in Amman. And I thought, you know, this, if I have to put it together, my quality of life in how my relationships are, my sense of well-being and how a day feels, this is the hardest and most difficult way of life that I have had to live. And the most expensive as well. So I, my head was beginning to think, okay, perhaps the world's value systems are of worth and wealth and power um, need to change and to add the sense of well-being into it in a way that makes sense. And, and, and people were not really understanding why I was not um, saying, oh my God, this is it, I've now arrived. And I was beginning to say, well, you know, perhaps I should be based in Africa and do this work from there? And I was beginning to pose that question. So I'd come back to London, which is where I am now, on my way back to Kenya to begin to work there because I, I, I was just exhausted by New York. Then COVID happened and I found myself here um, and had to quickly reframe my thinking and, um, and realize that the world had changed. So that moment, um, so many things changed. And it was interesting for me because my background as a virologist, so I understand um, viruses, I understand um, the trajectory of a pandemic. Um, but for the first time, the impact of one thing on the social, e you know, economic, cultural, every part and globally for all of us to be feeling the same thing at the same time, um, it's, I don't want to use the word unprecedented because everybody uses it all the time, but it's a moment of pause. And this is a difficult time and we're not out of it 
yet. We're in the heightest, perhaps, of um, of the lockdown, but we are still squarely in a pandemic. We 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 are not through the other side, but but we are we are taking more breaths now than than we were before. And many people have called um, this crisis the great equalizer because everybody in the world is being adversely impacted. But the truth is, it's not an equalizer. It's perhaps really, really shining a light on all kinds of inequalities. So it's not it's not surprising what what has happened after that. We we were all locked down, but we were not all locked down in the same way, and we, the impact and our survival rates were not the same. And it's tragic. And we could see the scale of inequality and 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 how awful it is to live in a world in in the world that's so unequal. But let me um, share with you, I think Nicole has um, a, a slide which comes from the World Economic um, the World Economic Forum, which looks at the impact of COVID um, on the world. And I wonder if you can share that slide, um, Nicole? Please let me know if it's sharing. Okay. So, all kinds of things are happening and it's waiting so it's affecting all our all all our systems and so the world economic the world economic forum has um done a slide that shows the most likely fallout for the world um aha there it is so i'm not sure you can see it but i'll read them out for you so that you just quickly see the scale of what I'm talking about um, and what we all recognize, but it's easier when, some, when, when a body like the World Economic Forum puts it in, into perspective. So the most likely fallout of this crisis is prolonged recession of the global economy, surge in bankruptcies, big firms, SMEs, wave of industry uh, consolidation, failure of industries or sectors in certain countries to properly recover, high levels of structural unemployment, especially amongst young people. And in yellow, you see tighter restrictions on cross-border movement of people and goods. So this globalization that we felt, um, our ease of movement, our ease of even thinking, the idea that we are one world, that is shifting dramatically um, and, and we don't know where it will end. The weakening of fiscal positions in major economies, protracted disruption of global supply chains. So um, our ability to get things from all over the world, especially if you're in the developed world, um, or if you're like in London, in New York, being able to source anything from anywhere very quickly, that has been disrupted. And the economic collapse of emerging markets and developing economies, so Africa, Asia, many of those economies are in crisis. And so also the most likely fallout predicted, you can see in purple, one of, one of them, cyber attacks and data fraud due to sustained shifting working patterns. We're all working from home, we're all online, and we're all much more carefree about using technologies which perhaps we didn't, we weren't in the ways that we weren't before. And um, there may be another global outbreak of COVID-19 or a different similar infectious disease. So this may not be the last pandemic. So that's scary and it's in red, but that is something we cannot shift our thoughts away from. There's um, additional unemployment, exploitation of the COVID crisis for geopolitical advantage. As we can see everywhere in the world, leaders are confusing us in many ways and leading us in different parts. Um, and there've been government em emergency measures. But the last few, I think, um, is important. This one, exacerbation of mental health issues. We're seeing that everywhere. And that's why I'm particularly pleased that this conference looks at well-being and not just in a cursory way of m mentioning that we should take care of ourselves, but actually brings professionals who offer us tools, uh, knowledge about well-being and what we can do, well-being and fitness, because that's going to be critically important as we move forward. Um, I, I won't go through the last four, two, the three, but you, you have said them before, inequality, uh, inflation, and um, humanitarian crisis. Um, so that's um, what the World Economic Forum shows as the, the fallout. 
But for women, let me get back to, to our focal group here at the Anikazi Center. For women, it's so much harder. This crisis, as I said, is not a great equalizer in many ways. It's actually impacting women in women, women led businesses, female led businesses in very serious ways. It's true that women are not as um, at risk as men in terms of the disease, but when you look at businesses, um, a report published by the World Bank and the OECD shows, uh, it's the report that's published every month, it's called the Global State of Small Business Report and it has very good data, I encourage you to look at it. And it says that female led small and micro businesses are seven percentage points more likely to be closed than male led businesses. And they are also, um, and female led leaders are, third, are, are more likely, female led leaders are more, more like, female business leaders are more likely to lead uh, micro businesses that have no employees. So many women are running nail shops, hairdressers, those micro, micro businesses which have kept their families and their communities going for a very long time and, and, and they were, that was a good way to make a living. Um, but they are more impacted by this lockdown and social distancing measures than many men. So that's the problem landscape. And I'm just reiterating it so that we see where we are. In Africa, of course, it's very much more problematic because 58% or more of women are, are are uh, self-employed, but they're self-employed in the informal sector. And sometimes they're, they're employed and you can't call it really employment. Uh, they don't see it as employment. It's simply how they bring, um, they make a daily wage, but they, at the same time, um, they are taking care of families, they're taking care of communities. So the burden is so much harder um, around and it's not recognized even their contribution to the economy. and. Is, is not recognized in the same way as a men's contribution. And, and, and that is problematic and has to change as we move forward. Because we've always known that over 70% of um, the economy in many African countries is informal. And yet, when you look at economic policies in most African countries, they are not supporting in the informal economy. And this COVID-19 crisis has completely decimated many, many uh, households, families, businesses, market women, um, rural farmers who can't take their goods to market. And those supply chains have been completely broken, transport links broken. So it's absolutely um, dire. But I was asked to um, share with you a few strategies for rising above this pandemic. And I like I like that term about rising above because when we talk about resilience, we sometimes um, ask people to imagine a cork. So you know, like the cork of a wine bottle when it's in a body of water and it can be a large body of water and this cork may be bobbing up and down and it's just a little thing, but it doesn't get submerged because it is resilient enough to keep on staying afloat despite the turbulence. And so there's a way in which you, I, and others as micro, small and micro businesses, we are that cork in this turbulent sea, in this ocean, going up and down, feeling the waves. But we might be able to rise above and we might get to shore, we might get to the other side and, and we may be okay. So let me, in the second part, and I'm, I'll be closing soon, offer you five, five things, uh, five points, five key messages about how you can become the change that you want to see in the world in the midst of this change that you are experiencing. So the first thing I would say, uh, the first um, uh, idea, advice I want to share is that you should embrace digital technologies to make yourself seen, heard, and valued. Now I'll break that down. Seen is, is what you normally understand, of course. If you don't have a website, you should have a website. You don't have to have a full-blown fancy website. You can have a blog site, which acts like a website. But people need to be able to see you. Whatever you're doing, you should be seen so that people can have an idea of what it is that you're doing. And these days, it's easy, it's affordable, and 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 and, and you can do that. OK, and if you can't have a website, um, because there is a digital divide, and it is difficult, especially for women in the developing world, Social media is still available. So WhatsApp groups that are selling um, uh, um, 
things or getting people to know about where they can go to get things. So they've been particularly helpful for building resilience during this crisis. Um, uh, Instagram, Twitter, all of those platforms, even TikTok, which is now rising, is really helping people to see what's available and, and understand where the markets are. Now, you can become a social media influencer yourself, micro-influencer, and if you can't, then support a young person who's a micro-influencer who loves this technology to collaborate with you, to help promote your work. And there are many young people, African uh, micro-influencers, young people who are online, you can offer them, you could be in the US with your business, and perhaps you really don't like social media and you really don't have time for it, but there's a young person out there who thinks your things are cool, and perhaps you can collaborate with that young person in an African country who can be your social media voice, can post every day, can retweet, can connect with you, and there you're, you're creating a job for the young person, you're transferring knowledge, and you are also opening up and you are being seen and they are being seen. And one of the things we have to remember now is that what we used to think about as mainstream there is no mainstream anymore in the way that we used to because the gatekeepers many of those gatekeepers have fallen and it's it's difficult for us to to see that it's difficult for us to embrace that sometimes because we used to people telling us what's the top 10 what's the best of this what's the best of that in many ways we have to curate our own top 10 my top 10 african necklaces my top 10 african headbands you know and and we can curate them on pinterest and we can create our own pathways to our own markets and we don't have to rely on those mainstream gatekeepers anymore to be the voice and so in this way we can be seen and also it's important to be heard so yes you can be visual and yes people can see your goods yes people can understand your business whatever your business is but they need to know what's behind that more and more people are thinking and, and wanting to be more intentional in how they access markets, intentional in what they buy, conscious about what their contribution is in, in for every dollar you spend, where are you spending it? Is it helping to sustain the planet? Is it, is it causing waste that is going to destroy oceans? People at all levels are becoming more conscious about where they spend. So it's important for you to describe your products, not just to show them so that people see them, but to talk about them and to talk about your values, your ethos, the community behind what you do, why you do it, all of that, who you are, what your vision is. It's more important now to have meaning attached to every business, every product than it ever was. We are people that like narrative. We are storytellers. We are attached to stories. We don't just, we're not magpies. We don't just like shiny things. We like, we like meaning. We want, when I wear this, this necklace today, I think of the Maasai women and I see their faces. And it's not just that it's a pretty necklace, it's that those Maasai women, I've, I see them sitting there doing this beadwork and, I'm, and, and I feel great that I can show this with the world. So there's meaning in everything that we have. And then lastly, valued. So, you use these digital platform and you tell people value. If, if nobody's valuing you, you find a matrix to say, do you know if you buy my product, you are supporting five households and they are going to uh, be able to pay their bills every month if you buy three of my products. So this is how your connection with me creates value and why it's valuable. I am the only one holding this space in my little corner, in my space, and so, I'm valuable. So you have to develop your indices of value and not necessarily wait for anyone to validate that. And you can do that using all your digital platforms, not just to be seen. So be seen, be heard, and be valued. And my second point is take a long-term view. The road is long. We don't know where it's going to end. And if there's one thing that this crisis has done for us, it has brought us the wisdom the wisdom of unknowing, which is um, a mystical thing of embracing the sense of unknowing. I don't know. And there are many unknowns. And I will live 
in the fact that I don't know. And I will trust that what I don't know will become clear as and when it should be. And so there's a wisdom when you get beyond the fear in this space of the unknown. And so in this space of the unknown, let's leap forward and not be afraid of the future. Take a long-term view. So when I was a scientist um, in Oxford, that was many years ago, more than 20 years ago, but I used to work on bacular viruses and they are plant um, viruses. So they're insect viruses. They're, they're, so they attack insects that eat plants. So we were looking at uh, pest management. So these uh, viruses, the one that I was studying, can stay dormant for 100 years. It can stay dormant in the soil for 100 years until exactly the right condition, it comes back to life and becomes infectious again. So viruses have a long-term power. And so when I was working, I began to think about, it's viruses are so curious because they're not living things, they're not living organisms, they don't, they're not, you know, they're not sentient. So, you, but the way in which they navigate um, all the things that we try to do to get rid of them is really curious. So I was always thinking about how a virus behaves and what we can learn from that. So like this COVID-19 virus, it has a simple plan. It hijacks the system and it uses the system to recreate itself and then it comes out and finds another place to hijack and recreate itself. It's a simple plan. And so perhaps hijack, so my, my advice is take a long-term view and it's not about hijacking the system, but it's about understanding where you and your business can be positioned in order for you to recreate what is valuable and for you to get more of that and then to be able to transmit it as easily as possible. It's a simple plan. Find a place where you can replicate and your business can replicate and be mission driven in that. The third, the third, um, the third thought that I'd like to share with you is realize and recognize that your success matters. It matters not just so it doesn't matter what you're doing, but you are contributing to a global economic system which is, as you know now, very, very fragile. So for every business and every business owner that wants to give up because they're so disheartened, they're so worried. I want to encourage you to realize that it's important that you succeed because we need you to succeed. The world needs you to succeed. So don't diminish your importance. It, and it's not just that the world needs you to succeed. Women need you to succeed. Our daughters need to see women succeeding. And for those that are black owned, black led businesses, it's important that black-led businesses succeed so that we can become more able to support our communities and less, um, uh, less time asking for handouts and be able to build and to develop. So every single black-owned business is going to change the narrative of the future. Don't give up. It's really important that you continue in this. The fourth, the fourth key message is be part of the is part is be part of the creation of a new economic system. Get involved in the conversation about what comes next, because what was before the capitalist world order, the way the world was balanced, everything is now up for renegotiation. Get involved. Get involved in the conversation at every level, in your community level, in the household level. Share what you know. Vote. Go out there. Be active be part of the new creation because it will define how you live. And this is a wonderful moment for you to have, for all of us to have a better world that we, you know, and, and to have a systems that, that, and all the things we complained about, it's now it's time for us to actually be involved and stop complaining, but be, be part of a solution. And my final point, um, form a, an empowering global connection as, as part of your business value chain. So on the one hand, we're encouraging um, business owners to build resilience in terms of shorter value chains. So look at um, if everything shuts down and transport link shuts down, how can you still be able to do what you do without having to go too far and it costing you too much? So we're encouraging um, you looking at shortening your value chain as much as possible. But at the same time, you can be part of a global community. You can be part of a global community that helps you to design your business. 
And many business owners now, really what they're looking for is somebody to talk through, to connect with and say, what do I do now? How did you do it? How are you changing? I have a hairdresser shop and here are my challenges. How are you doing it in your community? And you can form a global connection where that learning can be faster so that you don't have to suffer in silence, but you can learn and expand. So these partnerships can expand to form a global sisterhood of female-led businesses. And I, I've actually just started um, a, a, new, a new company with um, a, a Spanish sister of mine who's a filmmaker. And we were just having conversations about film and narrative and how we want to be part of um, telling different stories myself about Africa and what it can bring. And herself, because she's a documentary filmmaker, about that. And together we talked about that and the creative um, uh, pathway, how creatives live. And together we thought, why don't we team up? Why don't we team up and see what we can offer the world? And that's how we can form global sisterhoods of um, uh, global partnerships and global sisterhood. So my final point is for us to embrace the fact that change is just a part of life. Change is, the, change is what tells us we're alive. Every change we have reminds us that we're not dead. So let's embrace the change, tough though it may be, let's remind ourselves I'm in this flux because I'm still alive. And let's harness it. So the Im image that I think about is like, change sometimes is like a wild horse. So you're riding this wild horse and if you don't ride this wild horse well, you could get thrown off it and you could suffer severe injury or death. But if you ride this wild horse like a jockey, like a champion, you could become a winner. So change is that wild horse and you're seated on it. It's time for you to sit properly, take the reins and look, look ahead because there is going to be a finish line and you can be part of the winning. You can you can be part of the winning group. So I guess I'll end there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sheila, for sharing your information and wisdom and, and nuggets with everyone. We truly appreciate everything that you just shared with us. Thank you again.